Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sac Town Talks, where we talk everything Sacramento politics. Today, we're glad to be joined by Assemblymember Isaac Bryan. Isaac, glad for joining us. Welcome to the program. Really good to be with you. Thank you for having me. I know. Awesome to have you. We've been, we've been trying to nail this down for a while, so it's so good to, to get you in here. Uh, you know, one of the younger members and always, always great uh, to have someone with a different perspective on. You have like one of the most unique backgrounds, I think, of, of, of any member. Uh, can you kind of tell us a little bit about, you know, you growing up and kind of how you got yourself to California? Yeah. So it, it, it it's timely because it's Foster Youth Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do a lot of reflecting because we always do a resolution yeah. every year in the house. I, I grew up in a family that did foster care for 26 years um, and adopted nine of us. Um, I got to the Bryan family because my mother was a teenager when she got pregnant with me. Um, she got pregnant during a rape, uh, decided to carry it f- to term. Oh, there wow. was no family uh, to take me in. Um, she couldn't provide for me. She gave me up. Um, the Bryan family lived in Texas and Florida and kind of all over the country. Mm-hmm. And in every place uh, that my parents lived, they uh, adopted children <laughs> and did foster care. So like I said, they adopted nine of us overall. Um, I had probably 200 foster siblings. Uh, in the Bryan household, uh, it was pretty much just the place for anybody who needed it, somewhere to go. That was our house, uh, and my mom would would get so attached to some of us that it's like you should keep you. Yeah, you're you're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it you know it was beautiful. But a family that big, uh, they had four biological children as well. So I have twelve brothers and sisters. There's thirteen of us total. Wow. We moved a lot to try to make ends meet. Um, to try to you know make sure that uh, there was enough opportunity for each of us. I ended up in in California when I was uh, twelve years old. Sixth grade. So so your foster family actually moved from different state to state? Yeah, um, mostly chasing jobs. So, like, my dad's originally from Illinois. Mm. Mom's from Arkansas. They ended up in Texas and then Florida and then back to Texas right. and then Utah for a couple of years and then California. And then they're actually back in Arkansas. Um, right now. Right now. Left California a few years ago. Yeah, cheap living over there, right? <laughs> cheap living, a lot less kids in the household. Um, you know, simpler, yeah, s- slower. So when, when did they stop doing the the foster? When was the last foster child you had? Yeah, it was, uh, maybe five or six years ago. Okay. I mean, you know, my, my mother has a passion for service. Right. Uh, we all kind of demonstrate our passion for service in different ways. Mine is policy making and thinking kind of macro. Hers is, you know, one child at a time. Mm-hmm. So like what states did you live in as a, as a kid? Yeah, I, li- I was born in Texas, then immediately went mm-hmm. to Florida and then back to Texas. And then to Utah for a couple of years, and then to California. So, what was it like living in, in these different states? <laughs> it as, was kind of as great. a faster child. I mean, you you definitely get a you know a full landscape for what um, the country looks like, right? Mm-hmm. And and you start to identify with people from different backgrounds and different ways and different spaces. Uh, moving that much, it, it destabilizes your education a little bit, though. Right. So, struggled some, you know, getting my footing that way. And for some of my siblings, that much movement kind of turned them off to to people mm-hmm. in public spaces. And for me, it did the opposite where, you know, you could drop me anywhere. I'm going to be okay. Um, and I can see the good and the humanity in anybody. I've, I've met people throughout my life who remind me of, of kind of all of the other people I can see. I love looking at the house floor here in the assembly because, you know, I see a range of my siblings and other people I've come in contact throughout my life uh, in my colleagues who represent different parts of the state. So you're always like going to a new school, having to meet new people, kind of put yourself out there. Uh, we're, I guess were you able to like you know play sports and kind of you know basketball was my saving thing? grace. Yeah, um, I went to three high schools. I went to three elementary schools. Um, I played basketball all the way through. Um, played football and ran track at my first high school, and then just stuck with basketball at the next two. Um, but that was kind of the thing that kept me kind of grounded, no matter where I went, and it made it easy to meet friends who were other basketball players, and then just kind of um, socially find a way to integrate. It was it was difficult though. I mean, you have to you know. You build some social currency yeah. on a campus, and then uh, immediately it's erased, and you start over. Who would you compare your game to? <laughs> uh, my game. Uh, I was like a, a three guard. Uh, I didn't want to be your primary ball handler, mm-hmm. um, but I, I could jump, and I like to play bigger than I am. And then I had a little pretty jump shot. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I guess the three point uh, obsession wasn't wasn't quite there yet though. Not quite there. No. So I tell people that they're like, oh, you know, you came from the Steph Curry. No, nah, Curry came a little bit after me. I'm from like the You're Vince like Carter, Rice. Kobe, T Mac. <laughs> we try to dunk on yeah. everybody. That didn't matter how tall you were when I was playing. You were trying to dunk. <laughs> so uh, your form about sixth grade. You, you moved to L A. and I, well, you stay there through high school. Yeah. So where'd you go to high school? Uh, actually, in the Inland Empire. So went to Marino Valley. Spent some time there. Spent some time in. Um, 
uh, Etiwanda, Upland, Rancho mm-hmm. Cucamonga area, a um, couple community colleges, uh, and then got to L.A. for uh, formally for grad school. And then, what, you went to University of Arizona yeah. for, for undergrad. Um, so I, you're, you graduated from U- University of Arizona. Like, what what drew you to come back to, to California and L.A.? So my family, um, I um, my parents were still here, but also, you know, I have a younger sibling who um, started coming to conflict with the law um, at an early age, unhoused. I have an older brother who's unhoused and um, a sister. Um, so all my siblings were struggling still here in California. And Arizona was like never home, right? Mm-hmm. I would have gone to college, undergrad out here if I could have gotten into California school. Um, California schools did a thing back then, and I'm not sure if they still do, but you have the A through G requirements, and then our schools are also so overly subscribed that you don't write a personal statement, mm-hmm. right? They don't really care where you're coming from or what you what you've been through to get here. Arizona was different, um, and I was allowed really? to kind of yeah, I was allowed that seems to, like totally backwards yes, from what to try to make the case yeah. for like why I'd be a great student and. Mm-hmm. And looking through all that I had been through um, and seeing that narrative reflected in my three transcripts from three high schools, they they saw a potential that, you know, California schools just didn't. Right. Um, but this was always home. So I knew I wanted to come back. So you, know, you come back to California. What, do you work for a while or do you go straight to, to grad school? Straight to grad school. I mean, I worked all the way through undergrad. So you must have done pretty good in undergrad to get into UCLA grad school, right? I, I I had an interesting undergrad. Yeah. Um, it was it was long. I was working you know three restaurants. At one point, I was a front of house manager for a California Pizza Kitchen. Um, I was hustling yeah. through through undergrad. I thought for a period of time I was going to drop out of school and just run restaurants. <laughs> um, I thought that might be what I did. Um, I did really phenomenal my last seventy five units, um, in particular, which you know people don't often tell you this, but it's really how you finish. In high school and in undergrad, mm-hmm. that shows the trajectory for where you're headed. And you can make that argument to a graduate school. And so I made that argument to UCLA. I made that argument to Arizona. Arizona had seen me perform the last right. uh, two and a half, three years, and they offered me a full ride to stay. Wow. They were starting a master's in public policy. I was going to be their kind of cornerstone um, first class of students, full ride, health insurance, a teaching job. And uh, I just wanted to come home really, really bad. So when UCLA let me in. Pretty hard to say no to UCLA. Pretty hard. Yeah. I mean, I wrote about going to UCLA to play basketball mm-hmm. when I was, you know, in sixth grade. Like, <laughs> Right. So uh, you get to UCLA. You're doing a, a master's in public policy. Yeah. Was being elected in your mind at that time? Or kind of what, what drew you to public policy at that, at that time? So I got my undergrad in political science. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember watching Barack Obama sworn in as a junior in high school. Um, and that was a pretty big moment for me because prior to that, I hadn't seen, you know, my potential as anything outside of a basketball player or I don't know, music or something. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You're so limited in what you think you can become based on what you're shown um, for people who who look like you or identify with things that you identify with. And to, to see the first black man president, I was it was kind of mind blowing for me. I remember taking my driver's license picture with the Hope Obama shirt, you know, the little red and blue yeah. one. Like I kept that driver's license photo for like 10 years after that. Um, you know, cause that was, it was authentic to, to the time I was, I was in. And so I studied political science, sociology. Um, I knew I wanted to make the world better. I had seen the way systems failed, mm-hmm. um, you know, from the time I was born to all of my foster siblings and the different ways poverty and struggle lead you to the child welfare system where having contact with poverty, struggle and the child welfare system leads to poor education outcomes, which then leads to an increased likelihood of incarceration a decreased likelihood of, of um, lifetime earnings or home ownership. I mean, all of these things just start compounding really fast. And mm-hmm. I knew at a very early age that these weren't all just moral failures of families and children and whole communities, that some of these things were structural designs that right. we could we could redesign. We could make a little bit different, a little bit more equitable. So that's what I studied in school and then tried to get active in making those changes any way that I could. And what you ultimately find out is no matter how you're advocating, you're going to end up talking to elected officials and asking them, pleading with them, making the case to them, begging them to do something right. that you think is more equitable uh, and more fair. And at a certain point, it, it became apparent that it's easier to just be one. <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. We've, yeah. we've made a quite a difference in a short amount of time. I mean, you know, looking at the the runway of time I have in the legislature, if, the community continues to to send me up here. We can do a lot of good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, how many how many foster brothers and sisters do you have? I have none now. I have uh, twelve brothers and sisters. Twelve brothers. Okay. Nine of us were adopted, but I've had 
hundreds of foster so, siblings through my life. So you, I guess, uh, and, and you, uh, you've seen the, I guess, the gamut of, of different backgrounds, different lives. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think went so right with you in your life that you are where you are, where some of your other siblings didn't and, and why? Yeah. Many, many chances. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and the first thing actually was getting cut from the basketball team my senior year in high school. Um, I was pretty close to academically ineligible my junior year. Um, I had failed my coach's history class. <laughs> um, and, you know, he wasn't going to take the chance my senior year. And it forced me to kind of reevaluate my whole life mm-hmm. um, at a time when I still was early enough in my education journey to, to pivot and make a difference. Right. For some people that happens in junior college, some people that happens um, at a four year university, some people it's after college when they don't make it professionally, where they have to go through this whole mental reevaluation of who you are, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, I turned it I turned into a stellar student my senior year and I took uh, dual enrollment at two community colleges. I mean, really started to to change a new trajectory. And so grateful to, to Coach Smith. Uh, for 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 that cut, <laughs> giving you that free time. Yeah, and I mean, he wrote a letter of recommendation right. for me to go to college. I mean, it it wasn't personal. It was it was challenging me to to really live up to my fullest potential in other ways. Um, and then, you know, I, thankfully, I never came into contact with law enforcement, mm-hmm. uh, even when I made you know terrible decisions in college and before. And I won't go through all those on a podcast now that I'm in office. But um, uh, you know, the kind of decisions that could trip people up, things that are relatively common for, for young people, the kind of mistakes, you know, many of us make, but things that never led to criminal legal consequences for me or or heading down that route. Um, I had, you know, different people who mentors who were looking out for me. My first mentor at Arizona, first mentor I ever had in my life, he was a former law enforcement officer in Wisconsin for 20 years, got his PhD in economics. He used to leave his door open, his office door every Tuesday and Thursdays. And it wasn't like broad office hours. It right. was just Isaac office hours. Mm-hmm. And he became a therapist, a, a father figure or a mentor. He taught me about graduate school. He challenged me to read. First time somebody ever put academic literature in my hand. And I'm like reading different case studies and reading scholars who are arguing with each other, right. but you know, critiquing their methods. I mean, he really helped me develop as a thinker and a scholar and so I think for a number of my siblings, they didn't have all of those right. opportunities or, or they ran into a, a challenge in school or with the criminal legal system really early on and have been tripped up ever since. So, you know, you're really unique because you haven't been handed anything, right? You've no. you've had to earn everything you've given. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you're, you know, experiencing life like a lot of, a lot of Americans have. Um, you know, you have, I, I presume, student debt, right? Absolutely. You're a young person trying to buy, you know, trying <laughs> to find a way, Biden trying to buy a house. Every time Biden forgives them, I, I log on to see if I qualify. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, how, how did you put yourself through school? Because, you know, that's a big undertaking for a lot of people who don't come from wealth or don't have mom and dad to pay for it or take loans and, you know, kind of put yourself to where you are now. Yeah. So it's it's actually funny. I, I also wasn't taught, like, how to go to college. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the... Yeah, nobody did your applications for you. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, I did all that myself. I took the very last SAT as a senior in high school because one of my friends who was a stellar student told me you had to do this for college. Um, I was like learning on the fly. Um, I couldn't actually afford that first year at Arizona. I was an out-of-state student and I needed a private loan because uh, I hadn't figured out how to work FAFSA yet either. Mm. Um, I, I literally wasn't taught any of these things. I wasn't sure I was going to go to college. Um, around that time, I actually connected with my biological mother and her husband signed my private loan to pay for my first year at Arizona. Wow. And then I got um, a couple of jobs and started to really support myself and they converted me to in-state tuition because it was clear that I was like working and mm. <laughs> paying bills right. and like not just a student. Um, and once it converted to in-state tuition, um, I continued to, to borrow until I was done. And when I came to UCLA, I, you know, my, my professors and my classmates will tell you, nobody worked harder than me. I was 75% time, um, employed, which you have to get an override to go over 50%. I was a a TA, I was a researcher, I was a peer outreach coordinator, um, but it came with a full fee remission uh, and a monthly stipend. I also was um, awarded the Bonnet Fellowship, which is a $30,000 fellowship that also placed you in the LA mayor's office. They choose one MPP per year, one MSW and one urban planner. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was uh, 
chosen from our class. So I was I was doing whatever I could to make ends meet, but also continue to further. So that's crazy. You work full time. All the time. And you're just paying your debt down as, as you went. It's funny because I also, you know, I, I slang pazookies at the BJ's at the <laughs> yeah. Fox Hills Mall. And, and now I represent the Fox Hills Mall in Sacramento. Um, and so it's it's interesting, you know, what hustle and hard work can can get you, but also you need those opportunity doors. Right. So I, I guess that, that was your, kind of your first taste of politics being in the mayor's office. Uh, you know, kind of what was that experience like working for Mayor Garcetti? So it was my first taste, but also not. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you what that experience was like. But before that, I got linked up with a professor at UCLA, Laura Abrams, who did a lot of juvenile justice research. And she was studying a minimum age of juvenile jurisdiction. Basically, there are other states that decide that they're not going to arrest and prosecute kids under a certain age because mm -hmm. you're a child. Right. Um, in Texas, it's 10. Um, in New York, it's 7, which is like really pathetic. Um, but like Massachusetts, it's it's 12 or 13. California had no minimum age. So we had like a six-year-old in Kern County who was in a detention center, wow. a nine-year-old, right? You just saw these cases across the state. And so I actually called the DAs, public defenders, judges, and law enforcement of the six largest states, red and blue, to kind of ask how they handle really young children when they do something bad or they get caught up in something and uh, wrote a bill based off of that with Professor Abrams, um, SB 439, carried by Holly Mitchell. So I brought that research up to her to set a minimum age of jurisdiction for California while I was in graduate school. Um, and she ran that legislation. Um, you know, I was one of the, the key sponsors behind it, and it turned into the law, and it's the law now. And so I did that before going right. into the mayor's office. So I got my taste of Sacramento early. Um, in the mayor's office, I helped with the Office of Reentry, basically Prop 47 resulted in money for local jurisdictions across the state. We had $6 million in savings that the city needed to deploy to provide kind of a network of reentry services. And so I wrote the city's first report on uh, the reentry needs of folks in Los Angeles, how many calculated how many people are coming to the city from incarceration, uh, and then met with, you know, folks who had recently returned from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, A New Way of Life, um, and others in the community to find out, like, what are the barriers? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes... We go and we talk to law enforcement. It's like, what do people need when they come home? You should really just ask the people who just got home. Like, what are you, right. what are you struggling with? Oh, you don't know how to use a phone. You've been gone and there's seven new iPhones later. You, you don't understand how to apply for a right. job online, right? You you don't have your birth certificate and your driver's license. And so you're excluded from this. Um, you uh, you know, all of these these different things that, that I, I learned, we converted that into a proposal to the mayor for how we could spend our $6 million dollars to build out education, employment, um, technical assistance, and other opportunities for, for folks across Los Angeles. So I did that for a year and a half and then went back to community to organize. And then so, you, so at what point did you start working with uh, Sydney and like start working, you know, directly with a member? Yeah, uh, it was a few years later. So I went back to UCLA and um, built up initi an initiative called the Black Policy Project. Um, the Ralph Bunch Center, uh, only organized black research center in the entire UC system. It was born out of student protests 60 years ago. Um, I got affiliated with that center after they got some state funding, and I built out um, a, a research arm to really understand the conditions of black life in California and propose meaningful interventions and solutions to closing some of those gaps. And while I was doing that work, um, Sydney also represented the campus in the legislature. Right. And so we got connected um, through that way. And um, she had asked me if I would um, run her district office, and I wasn't quite ready to leave the post I had at UCLA, and so I just asked if I could part-time be a part of this work with her, and she accepted, and, and then we started doing a little work together as well. And then at what point were you like, you know, Sydney's like, hey, I'm going to run for Congress. Like, did she say, like, you should, you should, you should run? Like who told you no, and, you and, should run? And, and it's funny because it's, it's always, you know, we think there's this kind of dark behind the scenes mm -hmm game that happens and maybe in some places they do um i ran a ballot measure in la county after george floyd was murdered with um now council member anisis hernandez before either of us were in office it was Measure j yeah um and it permanently allocated some of the county's budget towards alternatives to incarceration youth development small business support and affordable housing and that was 2020 um and we ran kind of a justice slate of elected right. officials with the ballot measure which included holly mitchell for supervisor at that time in L.A., if you lined up against Herb Wesson, like, you, you, you were heading the wrong direction right. politically. The labor fed was with Herb. The party was with Herb. 
Herb was local council president. Holly was up here managing the COVID crisis. Um, but as you now know, I had done some work with Holly, even going back to graduate school, um, and knew she was a champion for things that were right. So I lined up with Supervisor Mitchell heavy and hard. And when she won that seat, uh, that's when Sydney announced she was going to go for the Senate, for Holly's seat. And, you know, I'll never forget, it was like December, and, you know, Supervisor Mitchell calls me, and she goes, hey, I'd like to hire you as my justice deputy for the county, the highest paid justice deputy the county of LA has ever had. Um, I'm engaged. She's like, you can go home and spend time with Mara. You get a pension. We're like, we're right. do this. Yeah, it's a good deal, right? It's a, it's a great job, right? Yeah. I get paid more than members. <laughs> exactly. And I said, you know, I, I, I can't accept it. I've got to run for office. And she, she asked me why. And I basically told her, you're not there anymore. Dr. Weber's not there anymore. She was becoming secretary of state. Um, I have a little brother in Sacramento who was just recently picked up um, on the streets and, um, you know, had overdosed on, on fentanyl, um, he survived, but there were conditions that were happening across California that I was doing meaningful work in Los Angeles to improve, but recognizing that other people were slipping through the cracks outside of Los Angeles. And so I basically told her if I go to Sacramento, I can do the kind of policy work that will improve the conditions of life for 40 million people. And I think I need to do that. And uh, she made a contribution that night. Other other people didn't. Other people didn't know that because the filing didn't come right. out for you know three months, and other people then jumped in the race. So nobody was like, "You should do this." People were like, "Where is anybody like you should not do this?" No, in it's fact, not your time. In, in fact, Sydney and I didn't even talk about it until after she won the Senate special. <laughs> so I was, uh, we were both running. Mm -hmm. I was running for her soon to be vacated seat while she was running for the Senate, and it wasn't until after she won the Senate race where she called me and said, "Hey, I'm with you." Wow. And you were working together <laughs> the whole time? <laughs> uh, wow. I think I might have left the office yeah. um, before then um, when I started to run. I didn't work all the way up until So what, did you come in like 2021 then? or Yeah, in a special. In a special? Yeah. So do you technically have like 13 years or how did, how do your term No, I work? think I'm actually on the other side of that. I think I'm you a little like bit 11? short. That's why, you know, people are like, oh, you're moving fast and heavy. It's like, yeah, I got less time than y'all. It goes by fast. <laughs> yeah. It goes by fast. You're like, oh, you're young. Yeah, we got the same term limits and mm -hmm. mine are less than yours. So, so I, this is your, you're coming into like what, your third election cycle, but that's correct. you've only been here for what, five years? I've about? been here for three and three years and some months. Um, no, it's like, Caleb, what is it? Four years? I think it's four, four years. years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. The COVID years. Go exactly four years because I got sworn in House of Origin in 2021. Okay. So I didn't even get to like run a bill package. Yeah. Like I walked in and I, I probably should have. There was like here's some scraps. Yeah, I should have <laughs> forced a runoff so that I could have got the time if I was thinking about it because I won out right in the primary. Right. Field of six, but we took over 50 percent, and I just remember which speak, is not easy to do. I remember yeah. Speaker Rendon saying, "Hey, we need your vote. Yeah. <laughs> so let's swear you in so you can start voting." That's funny. So I guess, you know, four years, I guess, you know, you kind of done a lot. Um, kind of. So what was your, your focus? You know, you came up here with, you know, doing a lot of social justice stuff, criminal justice reform. Yeah. Uh, you know, has that been your focus since you got up here? Have you expanded that? Or are you learning stuff and getting into stuff you didn't think you'd be getting into? I, I think I came in with an intersectional approach to policymaking mm -hmm. that's not often common. I remember, I forget who told me, like, pick your lane and do that. And I was like, but my community, there are parts of my district that – don't have healthy food access, who have underperforming schools that have low home ownership rates and high rent burdens, that have um, lower income and lower earnings, that live next to oil wells and in uh, toxic health conditions, that have a high police presence. On, like all of these things are interconnected. Right. And so if you're working on one ignorant of others, I don't know that you'll fully improve the conditions of life like you're trying to. And so I've tried to stick to the things that I know and I've lived. So child welfare work, criminal legal system, um, where a lot of my scholarship is, um, but then also the things that are impacting my community, like the largest urban oil field in the country, the Baldwin Hills Inglewood oil field. If you're driving up La Cienega and you look out the window, it's it, it's dystopian. It looks like yeah. you're in like you're a- like, what, that's LA? Yeah, like Do a evil movie here? or yeah. something. It's like, no, this is right next to people's neighborhoods. Um, but I, our focus is on, on doing the kind of work that'll improve the real conditions of people's lives and- that's what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, you know, we were talking about like you've, you've earned everything you've, you know, have done. 
and it includes like you're you're a renter, right? You're one of the what three renters <laughs> at, the le- at the legislature. Uh, three in the uh, assembly, and the only one from LA. In the LA, and so like to buy a home in LA right now is like crazy, right? Like it was crazy ten years ago. And now, dude, it's I live good. on Crenshaw Boulevard mm-hmm. in a single family home with my fiance and our dogs. Our rent is like four grand, right? And this is like where I can see where Nipsey Hustle was killed outside my house, um, and it's forty forty two hundred dollars a month. That's crazy. Um, to so buy, to buy it, it's a, it's how a million many bedrooms, dollars. How many bathrooms? Um, ours is uh, three bedrooms, two bathrooms. Um, and so, yeah, so, so if you're to spend a million dollars to buy it, that would be like seven or eight grand. <laughs> it, well, your price would double, right? That's exactly right. And so we're, you know, thankfully I'm marrying up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, soft IP attorney. Uh, we met at UCLA. She's in her third year practicing. And so... She works for movie studios? No, no. she doesn't. Um, but she, you know, she does a lot of incredible work. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, together we're just going to slowly try to build something. Right. But even the hope that we can build something, I recognize is something that, you know, two generations are not feeling in the same way that generations before them. And so there's a lot of work we've got to do on the housing front. So, you're like, you're there. Like, have you seen your rent, like, go up more recently? Oh, absolutely. It's been hard. Like, what, what do you think is attributing to, I guess, the housing, you know, becoming so, so expensive? Yeah, uh, and like we put in so many resources doing, it's getting worse. It's not getting better, right? No, that's exactly right. Um, I think well, one I've lived in different parts of my district, and so my district is special. It's a it's a coalition district. I would call it a bridge district. We've got historic parts of South Central, Lamert Park, the Crenshaw Corridor, um, Slauson, but then I've also got like a piece of Beverly Hills yeah. and Mid Wilshire and Pico Robertson. So, um, you know, Mar and I, we've moved around because we're renters. I mean, this is like our seventh place in, you know, in the district. It's our fourth place since I've been in office. Moved basically every year. Um, and at one point we were living on Wilshire Boulevard in an apartment uh, that was more than our rent on Crenshaw is mm-hmm. right now. And so we, every year we're looking for a better deal. Um, and I've seen the rents continue to grow everywhere. It's not just in the affluent sides of town. It's in the struggling parts of town too. And I think there's a lot of displacement and push out that's going to come as a result of it. Part of it is we don't have enough housing. There's not enough options. The other part of it is that home ownership isn't isn't real. So we've got more six figure earners in rental units than we've ever had. And those are units that could be taken by other fo- folks. But as you're pushing people out of home ownership and into kind of a um, permanency and in, in, renting, in renting yeah. you're taking units that could otherwise be for folks just coming out of school or folks you know, working lower middle class jobs and all of this directly ends up with greater push out to the streets. And so we've got to increase housing access, housing affordability, and then keep home ownership alive, um, property ownership, because I don't believe that anybody wants a permanent rental class if if um, if the option to buy is still available. No, no, it's, it's pretty nuts. Like, I don't know. I, I know Assemblyman Ward has looked into this, like the corporate ownership. You know, is it people owning multiple homes or people just sitting on properties that they've right. inherited? Uh, is it the Airbnb or BRBO, like, driving these prices up? Uh, it's a lot of stuff, you know. You seem like a guy who's, like, really digs into stuff and kind of, you know, gets to know the grass bolts and stuff like that. Kind of, you know, what what can we do to kind of help fix this stuff and kind of move it back in the direction of affordability? Yeah, I think, one, we, we do have to build. We've got to build more units. We're hundreds of thousands of units behind just in my district. Uh, we're millions of units behind across the state. So we've got to build more units. But I think, you know, as Assembly Member Ward, Assembly Member Lee, or others are trying to get their hands on kind of this corporate ownership. I mean, housing can't be treated like a commodity or just a piece of a financial portfolio, mm-hmm. right? This is, it's almost like a, a public good, a need, a, a right people should have um, to a roof over their head. We've got some corporate um, players who own, you know, like whole neighborhoods. Right. And, you know, I'll buy the whole neighborhood for 500000 a pop, and then I'll sell the first two you know, a few years later for a million dollars each. And now the value of all the other ones I own just went up. Yeah. Um, and like, it's, it's a, it's not a free market. It's not a, a fairly competitive market when you have individual players who can, can buy it up. And then the question is whether this should be treated like a traditional market anyway, when it has such an, uh, an intersection with the foundational needs that people have. And so I think we've got to, we've got to look at all of these things, starting with our folks who are on the streets but also looking to keep tenants housed. That's the driver into homelessness. It's not actually people moving here for the weather. I know we think our weather is like phenomenal. It's it's funny when I hear that talking point, by the way, because it's the same folks who talk about the out migration from California. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what, you, the billionaires are leaving and homeless people are coming? Like, the, 
it's really not how this is working. Um, it, it is that growing income inequality that's driving all of this, but it's people who couldn't pay their rent, who then went to their car, who then lost their car, mm-hmm. um, you know, got it towed, got that parking violation. I've seen this play out in my family. I've seen this play out in community. And I know for even for Mar and I, you know, one financial emergency could 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 wreck us. Yeah. I mean, when when student loans got unpaused and came back, we were like, oh, my gosh, right. how are we going? How are we going to eat? Uh, you got to pay yours. I got to pay mine. Um, it, it, you know, it changed the living conditions for a lot of people. And so we've got to look at economic opportunity and financial security a, across the board in California. Wow. So, you know, you are the chair of the Natural Resources Committee. Yes, sir. Uh, how did that come about? How, how you know, you're a young member, yeah. pretty fresh. Uh, it's a pretty big deal being named chair of a, of a committee like that, right? Yeah. So I got my first chair chairmanship about six months in. Mm-hmm. Um, I got moving pretty quick um, in the body. I think, you know, my colleagues recognized a, a sense of authenticity and a willingness to tackle hard issues pretty early on, or at least I hope that's the reputation right. I'm given. Um, I'm also a pretty honest legislator. And so, you know, I... I I get passionate about issues, and then I try to tackle them. Um, I chaired the elections committee um, pretty early on. We did some fantastic work around prison gerrymandering. Um, We changed uh, the rules around the referendum process for the first time in 112 years. Um, Did a lot of work in that committee. Um, I was a floor whip before that. Um, I was floor leader for a stint, and then now chairing natural resources, I think, is in no small part because Speaker Revis recognizes I represent the largest urban oil field in the state. Um, and that uh, we've made a meaningful impact in trying to address that. I was the floor jockey for the setbacks bill a few years ago. People don't uh, remember that that was a gut and amend by Senator Lena Gonzalez. So it started in our house, and I don't think people thought we could get it out of our house. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I played my role in helping make sure that was the reality. There's also never been a black chair of the Natural Resources Committee before. And so I think there was an opportunity to do a lot of good, um, uplift the needs of my local community, and then introduced me to to more issues in this space than I realized. On the whole, like, I guess, oil front in California, you know, a lot of people don't know, produces oil. I guess yeah. it has a pretty good supply of oil. I don't know, on social media, you see, like, the oil companies, you know, putting uh, little digital ads out saying, oh, California's importing oil when we could just create it. Uh, and they talk a lot about the high-paying jobs and stuff like that. How do you balance that? You know, you have, you know, these jobs, I guess, in your community or near your community, which are, which are high-paying, but, you know, I guess they're producing something that might not you know, be the healthiest for Californians and something you're seeking to, to clean up. So how do you balance that? Yeah, I think, no, that's that's a great question. One, we've got to continue to invest in clean energy and our sustainable future. Um, but be pragmatic. We're not all the way there yet. We do still need some fossil fuels right now. Uh, and we'll never get there if we don't make the investments to transition off and uh, temper down our um, utilization of fossil fuels. We've got to do all these things at the same time. But uh, there are also many communities, especially with neighborhood drilling, where they're not actually extracting meaningful oil. Um, stripper wells are what what the industry calls wells that are doing less than 15 barrels a day. In my neighborhood, the average is three barrels a day. Wow. Right. Sometimes that's like 150 bucks a day. Um, The reason that they're still running is because it's 150,000 to plug it and clean it. So companies are doing the cost calculation. I could let this run for a couple hundred bucks a day, or I could pay several hundred thousand to clean it and get no residuals daily. But the environmental impacts to the surrounding community are the same, whether you're getting three barrels or 3,000 barrels because it's an uncapped and open well. And so in my mind, if you're going to drill right next to grandma's house, at least get enough mon- uh, enough oil to lower my gas prices. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not what we're doing right now. And so we're looking to, to address the neighborhood drilling effects while also investing in the clean energy we need to wean ourselves off of our oil reliance altogether. What are the effects of living near an oil or being near a well like that? Yeah, higher rates of heart condition, um, higher rates of childhood asthma, uh, higher cancer rates, lower life expectancies. I, I have literal community members and neighbors who have lost loved ones and they blame it on the Inglewood oil field. Um, you know, I think of, of a dear friend, Fran Jamont, who lost her husband, Bernie. Bernie um, died f- because of respiratory conditions. Bernie was a runner <laughs> who never smoked, <laughs> mm-hmm. took care of himself, right, but lived uh, just on top of the oil field. Um, Those are the kinds of real conditions. I'm thinking of Nayeli Kobo, who's testified in committee several times here in the legislature, who um, has just been on an incredibly challenging health journey because of living right next to an oil well. Um, We've got to balance, you know, our perceived need for fossil fuels um, with our real need for fossil fuels and our ability to transition off of them while people are literally dying who live near them. You don't see neighborhood oil drilling in affluent communities. 
You know, it's interesting. LA is kind of like a kind of a tale of two cities, right? You have the coast where a lot of kind of wealthy people live, and yeah. then you have the inland where a lot of the working and a lot of the pollution comes from. That's right. And it, like you have the port where everything comes in and moves over and then goes out, you know, to the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had a lot of, of people on both sides of this issue talking about our move to clean energy and is it possible or not? Um, kind of how are you seeing it, you know, as chair and seeing the technologies that are out there and seeing where we are? Kind of how close are we to have this, you know, mandate by 2035 that we you know we're not selling gas engines are we ready you know to to swear off oil and kind of to move forward with 100 percent electricity and if not like you know when when is that going to happen yeah well i'm ready (laughs) (laughs) um and you know full disclosure i I, i'm deciding i have a love-hate relationship with targets Mm -hmm. right because we'll set a target and sometimes we don't meet it oftentimes we don't meet it but then the question is if you never set it would you have even gotten close so I represent Cedar Sinai's hospital, for example. Since like 1994, we've had the retrofitting. Um, by 2030, you had to be retrofit as a hospital to survive an earthquake and be operational. Mm-hmm. Well, 2030 is around the corner, and many of our hospitals are telling us they won't meet it. But they're very close. They're much closer than they would have been if we hadn't set this retrofitting standard 30 years ago. Right. Um, and so I'm thinking the same way about our clean transition. Do I think we're going to be there by 2035? I think the better question is, are we going to do everything possible in our regulatory framework and our policy framework and in our culture shift to get us there by 2035? And so I'm hell bent on meeting that timeline. Um, I think we've also got a lot of uh, energy innovations coming our way. I mean, the federal government, the Biden administration has invested in environmental uh, justice and sustainability in a way we haven't ever seen before. Um, We're having conversations about hydrogen. What's clean hydrogen? What's green hydrogen? Um, is hydrogen good? Is hydrogen bad? We're having questions about offshore wind. We're having uh, questions about all kinds of different energy. We're having questions about uh, carbon sequestration and direct air capture and all of these new emergency emerging technologies. California is, is poised to lead. And kind of as your time as, as chair of natural resources, uh, kind of what's kind of like the coolest thing you stumbled from or kind of like an emergency technology where you're just like, wow, like we can do that? I think, I mean, one of the coolest things, uh, I took a group out to Heirloom um, not too far by, which is a direct air capture, mm-hmm. uh, which is different than kind of the the carbon capture at the point source. Like a, lo- a lot of places will, you know, the refinery will set up a carbon capture um, situation that will allow them to refine more and have the same impact. And people are questionable, um, skeptical, rightfully so, about direct air capture at the point source that allows the polluter to pollute more because they feel like they're offsetting it. What this was, we took a bunch of colleagues to place it's just pulling carbon straight up out the sky it's not tied to a point source Mm -hmm. it's hard to argue that it's not good that this is just coming straight from the sky um it was very very cool to see how that's done um there's a lot of innovation that can happen in that space in terms of making it smaller i mean you could you could end up in a situation where we're doing direct air capture at people's homes right the same way we got you got solar panels on your roof you got your (laughs) carbon capture in the back right. in the backyard you know right next to the air conditioner like there's there's a future for these kinds of things um, but we've got to invest in it we've got to continue to make those changes and I think it's also recognizing in terms of our natural resources there's just so many things that this committee touches on uh, incredibly grateful for the knowledge journey that I've been on I've learned more about plastics and waste hauling uh, than I ever had. Uh, thought I wanted to know. <laughs> um, we take a lot of things for granted, right. right? We just put our cans out at the street, and who knows what happens after right. that? Um, I know what happens after that. Now <laughs> you do, yeah. Um, so it's there's a lot of great work to do. Um, you know, we, we had a big, I guess, kind of May revise coming out, uh, yeah. big budget deficit. Kind of how are you approaching and your colleagues approaching kind of this bu- budget deficit and kind of looking at the May revise? I know, you know, foster care is something you're really yeah. looking into. Uh, kind of how are things looking in the budget uh, on kind of the things you care about in your district? Well, first and foremost, I'm incredibly glad that Jesse Gabriel is the budget chair here in the assembly. Um, Jesse's one of my better friends in the legislature. Um, he's thoughtful, he's collaborative, and I think folks feel like they have more of a voice in this process than they have in, in arguably the last 10 years. Um, and, and rightfully because we've needed it. We haven't been in this kind of budget deficit ever before, but certainly not in the last decade. I think the last time was the 08, 09 Mm -hmm. uh, Speaker Bass tenure. Um, There are some pretty drastic cuts that are currently proposed on the table. Cuts to climate change, cuts to foster youth, um, not upping child care rates, potential cuts to our schools in Prop 98, um, and education funding. Um, 
the biggest thing that I've been speaking out kind of openly and actively about, and the governor knows this, and and so do many other folks, is we have 15,000 empty prison beds. And that's not like, you know, let people home. It's like they're empty right now. 15,000 expected to go to 18,000. If we stopped operating those 15,000 empty beds, the state would save a billion dollars a year. What is that, like four facilities? It's four or five facilities worth of empty beds. We're basically running four or five vacant hotels, <laughs> 15,000 occupancy rate, and at 100 and some odd thousand per bed per year. Um, that billion dollars we could use to keep some of these programs floating. We could invest it in the communities that are most likely to have contact with the criminal legal system. What, what is killing me right now is this notion that, well, we'll leave them open because we might need them. We will certainly need them. When we cut the social safety nets across the state, we're cutting education, we're cutting economic opportunity, we're cutting uh, food access from our most vulnerable communities. What do you think happens after that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time, we're kind of beefing up retail theft crimes, right? This is, <laughs> who do you think is going to be stealing shit after we cut all of these social safety nets? And then where do you think they're going to go? Right. And so we're, we're predetermining how we want to spend our resources by not addressing this in a, um, a rooted and thoughtful, holistic way. And so I'm, I'm being pretty vocal about that. And I'm hopeful that um, the governor's proposal, which would save 80 million of the potential billion on the table, I'm hopeful that the assembly and the Senate are going to push back a little bit and demand that we do a bit more. Um, you know, foster youth is, is, you know, something we've talked about. You did a bill uh, last year and kind of brought back this year regarding kind of social security yeah. funds that belong to, to foster youth from DC's parents. Can you kind of talk to us a bit about that and kind of where that bill is at today? Yeah, absolutely. If, if your parents pass away, anybody, and they paid into social security, which is all parents, you are due survivor benefits. Mm -hmm. If you're in the child welfare system, often counties are either one, not applying for these benefits for you at all or two, applying for those benefits and then pocketing it into the general fund of the county. They're not setting it aside for you in any kind of high yield savings or trust or any way that would um, require that those funds be used directly and specifically for your benefit and not to augment the other child welfare dollars they get from the federal government. This isn't just a California problem, it's a national problem. CBS did a, a recent report between last year and this year um, highlighting how prevalent this is. There are other states, though, who do it differently. New Mexico is doing it differently. Uh, Maryland is doing it differently. The progressive Nebraska is doing it differently, right? It's, it's always great when California yeah. can follow the lead of Nebraska. Um, <laughs> eat your heart out, Nebraska. Uh, we, uh, we still are stealing this money from our foster youth. And so we've written a piece of legislation that will require the counties to, one, make sure you're always applying for eligible uh, children. We shouldn't leave that money on the table. We right. shouldn't, um, but two, if you receive uh, these funds as the payee for the child, you have to set it aside for them. You have to make sure that it's there for them to use and for them to have. Okay. So I guess, you know, you guys just had a big deadline. You just got through uh, what House of Origin. That's kinda right. What, what, how's your ledge package looking like in the Senate and kind of how are you feeling about your overall ledge package and how you'll end up in August? Yeah, I think I think we've got like 15 to 17 bills in the Senate. Wow. Which is, is pretty good. I feel pretty good about that. We we were very cost conscious of how to craft meaningful legislation that could change the way we do things without costing significant resources. Did you lose anything in the probes? <sighs> I lost a couple. Couple. Um, certainly not things that I voluntarily offered. Right. <laughs> really important things to me. No, I, we did. Um, we were proposing an office of tenants' rights and protections mm -hmm. um, for the state. We lost that. Um, we wanted to do a revolving commercial loan, uh, a revolving fund for commercial loans for nonprofits and community land trusts to fight displacement, where the state was back, would be backing loans um, to kind of keep communities that are being priced out only because they can't buy the commercial spaces they've been operating in for years. Um, we lost that as well. Um, but I think by and large, we did, we did pretty well. Yeah. It was two out of 17 or 19. Well, was most of them two? didn't have a cost. So they went straight right. to the floor. Oh. So we actually, we had sent, I don't know, seven, eight bills to the Senate prior to a probe suspense. Um, like I said, we, I've got a great team. Um, we've been thoughtful this year. Learn, learning the system. Um, so I guess, you know, how's your, how's your session looking at like at the end and kind of any, any plans over, over the break here in the next few months before, uh, you know, things kind of head out. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that we continue to make some progress on climate change. I do have an ACA that is still on the assembly floor, um, that would guarantee the rights to clean air, clean water and a healthy environment for all Californians. No brainer. 
Yeah, right there. Yeah. <laughs> who who would be against that? Um, and I know climate bond discussions are still deep and underway. Um, I'm hoping that both of those things can end up on the November ballot um, and really try to spark some interest in in this election and turn some folks out, especially younger folks who feel kind of unseen and unheard right now mm -hmm. across the political spectrum. Um, we do all that work and then and then go on on recess, but it's not really recess during election year. I don't I don't take for granted that we often have the highest win margin in the state in our race, um, or at least we did in the primary. Part of the reason that is is because we hustle hard. Right. So when I get home, it, we're gonna you know bring out community for coffees and conversations in town halls, and um, I'm gonna continue to build with build with my neighbors and make sure that we're all moving the same direction. All right. Well, Isaac, I know you're busy. You got to go, but thanks for coming on, sharing your story. Uh, love the energy and love to have you on uh, again to talk a little more in depth about some of these things you're working on. Thank you, man. I appreciate right. you. Awesome. Thanks.